Biden NSC as the Senior Director for International Economics, where he was jointly appointed to the National Economic Council. One final point before I do, Peter will take questions from the audience about 25 minutes uh, from now. So if you're watching remotely, you can submit your questions online. In person, please just raise your hand uh, and Peter will try to get to you directly. Our time with Mike is limited, of course, but I know that he's eager to hear from you uh, and respond to your queries. Peter, the floor is yours. Terrific. Thank you very much, Chris. And thanks to all of you for joining this morning, both those of you uh, who are able to be here in the room with us uh, and also those of you who are joining, uh, I believe, from all around the world uh, online. Um, I really want to, um, uh, it's such a pleasure for me to welcome to Carnegie a former colleague and a friend, Mike Pyle. Uh, Chris gave a great introduction to Mike's professional background, but what I'll add is somebody who had, had the opportunity to work with Mike is that apart from all his skill and work ethic, he's just a pleasure as a colleague and someone to work with, the type of colleague who's always on hand to talk about an idea or an issue that you're thinking over and he, who you can always learn something from. Mike, I think it's safe to say there's no shortage of international economic topics to discuss, and certainly more than we'll get through this morning. Just yesterday, the president gave a speech outlining his vision of Bidenomics. Uh, earlier this spring, the national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, gave a speech at which he laid out the administration's strategic vision for international economics. And you're at the center of actually selling that vision to America's friends and allies around the world. I suspect that pretty much everyone in this room is interested in the direction of US economic policy towards China, especially following Secretary Blinken's trip and with Secretary Yellen expected to go to China soon as well. Secretary Yellen last week made interesting remarks in Paris about World Bank and IMF reform and ways to mobilize hundreds of billions of dollars of additional financing for the developing world and to tackle global threats like climate change. Indian Prime Minister Modi just completed what by all accounts was a tremendously successful visit here to Washington last week. And I know that the administration is gearing up for a full agenda at the G27, at the G20 summit that Prime Minister Modi is chairing later this year. Just last night, I saw press reports that negotiations between the US and Europe on the global steel arrangement and on carbon border adjustment mechanisms for steel are heating up. And Mike, you have the privilege of being at the center of all of this. And I should have mentioned earlier, Mike has a tendency not to need much sleep, uh, as best I can tell. Mike, I'd like to start by asking about a couple of topics close to home. Uh, over the past couple of years, there's been nothing short of a revolution in American industrial policy with the CHIPS Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, and the Inflation Recovery and the Inflation Reduction Act mobilizing hundreds of billions of dollars in investment in American infrastructure and manufacturing. Just earlier this week, I saw that the Treasury Department put out an analysis noting that the U.S. has experienced a striking surge in construction spending for manufacturing facilities and that real manufacturing construction spending has doubled just since the end of 2021. I think it's fair to say that while these investments are transformational here at home, at least initially they spooked a number of America's allies and partners who feared U.S. incentives would poach manufacturing capacity from them and also worried that some of the U.S. incentives were a departure from longstanding U.S. commitments to WTO rules and other trade principles. I know that you and your colleagues across the administration have done a ton of work to negotiate with allies over implementation and to encourage them to adopt parallel industrial policy measures of their own. Let me begin by asking you how you assess the current state of industrial policy discussions with key allies in Europe and Asia, and are you purely focused on the sectors that we've already made decisions about domestically, semiconductors and clean energy, and critical minerals, or are there other sectors that you're talking about coordinating on as well? So first, just, it's a great pleasure to be here at Carnegie. Um, thank you for the introduction, Peter. It's great to be here with you. I mean, I think about all that I've learned from you over the past decade or more, and all of the work that you did to really uh, think through and be, you know, one of the key architects for all of the kind of new approaches on thinking about global economics. You know, it's just a great pleasure to be sitting up here with you and to have been your colleague for uh, the period that we were. Um, you know, to your question, you know, I guess the first thing I do is take a step back and maybe echo a little bit about what Jake talked about in terms of the diagnosis that the president had coming into office uh, and really seeing there being at least four interlocking challenges that, that he faced. You know, one was uh, the hollowing out of American industrial capacity 
two was the uh, stiffening competition uh, with China, uh, particularly recognizing uh, that uh, they were a country and economy that wasn't uh, playing by global rules. Uh, three, obviously, the climate crisis and the need to uh, meet the moment on climate change. And four, uh, the extent to which uh, the hollowing out of our industrial base uh, had caused uh, deep challenges for the American middle class, the American working class, and the ways in which uh, those challenges, the undermining of the position of the American middle class, was causing uh, pressures on American democracy itself. And I think what the president uh, concluded, and I think you heard him talk about this at length yesterday, was the extent to which uh, public investment, public investment in American infrastructure in the key sectors that are going to define the future in building our uh, capacity to uh, restore our, our uh, industrial wherewithal was really an answer to each of those four challenges. Uh, industrial hollowing out, China, climate change, challenge to American democracy. And I think we've seen that you know, play out, these historic pieces of legislation, each embodying an approach around public investment, and then some of the statistics that you cite around the investment boom, around ongoing strength in our labor markets, around uh, inflation coming down. So that's really been the heart of the, the president's approach here at home. But I think what we've said to allies, and one thing I would say is I think that, you know, it's, it's funny in some ways to, to hear uh, question marks around uh, the U.S. Uh, relationship with its allies uh, on some of these issues, because I think in some ways, in many ways, this is a period of historic strength of unity between ourselves and our closest partners and allies around the world. But our message to them has been, we can't do this alone. In fact, we need you to come along with us. Uh, we, we think that President Biden's vision is a model for the rest of the world. And we think that if you join us, we can meet these challenges together. And I think that's in large part what we've seen. You know, we've seen the EU take significant steps uh, with things like its Green Deal Industrial Plan, uh, with things like its Critical Raw Materials Act, to take significant steps towards public investment around the clean energy transition, around chips and others. We've seen things like this in the Canadian budget, significant uh, incentives around clean energy production in Canada, Japan, a handful of others. So this model of public investment meeting these challenges, rebuilding capacity, resilience, inclusivity, meeting the moment on climate, I think is really a model that we've seen take hold not just here, but around the world. What is the work that you know, I do? What's the work that you know, we do uh, in, in uh, the NSC and the NEC at the White House? It's really saying, OK, we're taking these common steps. How do we be sure that our approaches are aligned with one another? How do we be sure that uh, our acts of investing together uh, work to achieve our common ends, not work at cross purposes with one another? So for example, you know, I think you saw in March when President Biden met with President von der Leyen, um, you know, they articulated these shared objectives, these shared goals, the shared path to getting there, and then said, okay, we're gonna do a couple of things to really make that work. We're going to have a dialogue on our respective incentives around clean energy to make sure that uh, we really are expanding global supply around clean energy deployment, that we're being sure that our incentives aren't just providing windfalls to private interests, aren't undercutting one another. You also saw this in terms of the announcement around there being a, a critical minerals agreement negotiation between the US and the EU, saying, OK, we need to build uh, an ecosystem around the materials that will power the clean energy transition in a high standard way. Uh, and that's gonna be a mark of the cooperation that we have with one another. I think similarly at the G7 uh, in Hiroshima last month, you saw really that model between the president uh, and President von der Leyen extended to the G7 as a whole. And again, a kind of recognition that we have a shared set of goals, we have a shared toolkit to get there, and we're gonna use instruments like uh, like dialogues on incentives, like working together on critical minerals to be proof points on the ways in which we're going to work together to achieve those ends. Mm. Um, 
Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I'd like to um, turn uh, away from a bit uh, from the agenda for the industrial world. I think you kind of laid out a nice encapsulation of the agenda for the industrialized world for G7 and other peer economies around coordinating an investment first approach to, to economics. Um, but I'd like to turn to the agenda for the developing world, um, particularly with the G20 coming up uh, in a couple of months and the U.S. hosting APEC this year. You're obviously the APEC senior uh, official amongst your many other, uh, other, uh, other hats. And I think that while coordinating industrial policy measures can make a lot of sense for industrial democracies that have a lot of fiscal space, have a lot of the technology to actually make those kinds of investments, it can be a different question for the developing world, which needs fiscal support, which needs investment from abroad and can't necessarily just drive a domestic industrial policy the same way you know, we can across the G7. Um, it's interesting last week to hear Secretary Yellen lay out uh, an uh, iffy reform agenda and to push to galvanize hundreds of billions of dollars for the developing world. And I know the G7 is moving forward with the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and, Invest, uh, and Investment, or PGII. Um, but I do think one of the concerns we've heard out of a number of the developing countries, not to mention think tanks and trade associations uh, here in Washington, is that for the developing world partners, if we're not doing traditional trade deals, we don't necessarily have a compelling kind of practical value proposition to put on the table to them. Um, what do you see as the U.S. agenda for the developing world, you know, particularly in trade and finance as we look to the G20 and to APEC uh, later this year? Absolutely. I think that's a critical question. And I think that just as the agenda with other um, industrial economies begins with investment, so too, as you say, does the agenda for the global south, for the developing world, begin with uh, investment and building a toolkit to facilitate uh, that investment. I think that you know when you look at uh, the needs uh, in the developing world, whether it's around the clean energy uh, transition, whether it's around uh, public health, whether it's around uh, the the digital economy, the needs are overwhelming. Uh, and I think Jake talked about the need to mobilize you know, literally trillions of dollars uh, to meet those ends. So I think you know very concretely, uh, we're working in real time um, around an agenda for the multilateral development banks with the World Bank uh, at the lead uh, to uh, evolve those institutions for a changing set of global challenges with uh, resources and a mandate uh, that will be required to to meet those. So what is uh, what are we working towards? You know, I think uh, you saw at the spring meetings. Uh, some success at, at reorienting uh, the approach of the World Bank to focus on some of those global challenges like uh, clean energy, like public health, like uh, fragility, while maintaining a, a core focus on the traditional goals of, of, of development. Uh, you've heard Secretary Yellen talk about the need for uh, additional resource capacity at the World Bank and other MDBs and some of the reforms that were delivered at the spring, bank, spring meetings begin to do that. But that's really a down payment on a much more ambitious set of steps that we know we need to take moving ahead. Uh, and lastly, there needs to be a focus not just on uh, traditional uh, World Bank and other MDB resources, but uh, concessional resources for middle-income countries in particular, uh, you know, we know that the Brazils and the Indias of the world are going to be core to uh, meeting the moment on climate, to facilitating the clean energy transition uh, across the world and including in the developing world, and being sure that the World Bank and other MDBs have a toolkit that can reach to middle-income countries like India and Brazil with concessional resources is going to be a critical part of what it means to um, meet those objectives. So, you know, we're working between now and Delhi to, to really uh, align uh, the rest of the G20 behind not just this vision, but a, a concrete set of steps that we can take to deliver on it. And I think that's going to be core to the approach. You know, secondly, I point to things like the, uh, the, the debt crisis that we're mm -hmm. seeing in a lot of corners of the emerging world. This has been an issue that, uh, that the president, that Secretary Yellen has spoken extensively to both in public and in private. Uh, to make clear that you know, there are incredible pressures on uh, emerging economies around the world, in particular uh, around debt, that 
uh, all uh, members of the global community uh, have to play a, a part in, in uh, finding a solution to those debt challenges. Of course, China in particular has risen as a source of uh, debt to a lot of emerging countries over the last decade. And China in particular has a critical role to play in uh, producing a sustainable solution to that challenge. We were encouraged by what we saw in Zambia, uh, but there's a lot more to do even with respect to Zambia uh, from uh, China and the broader global community, and certainly a lot of other countries, whether it be Sri Lanka or Suriname or others that are going to require the same type of focus and ultimately constructiveness that has all too often been lacking uh, from China to uh, get to solutions for uh, those countries. We're gonna keep the focus there. We're gonna keep raising this issue. We're gonna keep pushing ahead uh, to make sure that the debt uh, is, an, is, is an issue that stays at the front of mind and that we get achievable solutions for uh, countries that are under distress. And then I think you know, the last piece I would say, you know, going to the final piece of your question is, I think we're very focused on um, new economic arrangements like the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, like uh, the America's Partnership, that we think are fit for purpose for the economic needs of the moment. Um, you know, if you think about kind of where we stand today, you know, we're at a place where average U.S. tariff rates are at historic lows, still 2.4%. Uh, where you've seen uh, trade between you know, the United States and Southeast Asia uh, double in dollar terms over the last uh, six or seven years. And so you know, I think that in a lot of respects, we don't see um, tariffs as being at the core of trade policy. We don't see trade policy as being at the core of international economic policy. What needs to be at the core of international economic policy? Well, an emerging set of challenges that haven't been addressed to date, things like supply chain fragility and resilience, things like climate and clean energy, things like anti-corruption, things like global tax. These are the kind of pressing economic issues internationally right now, and those are the places where we're really focusing our efforts when it comes to engaging with you know, Southeast Asia through IPEF, with Latin America through the Americas Partnership. No, thank you, and I, I think that's a a fair point at the end. You take a country like Vietnam, which we don't have a trade agreement with, I think exported goods worth approximately a quarter of its entire GDP to the United States last year, which is well over double what it was five or six years ago. So you are seeing that happen kind of anyway, and, and I can see the, the argument for focusing on other kinds of challenges. Um, I want to ask you a question about China. Uh, and there are so many questions that I could ask, you know, outbound investment issues, semiconductor rules, the tariff review, uh, and, and, and all the rest. Um, but I actually want to ask you a more strategic level question. Uh, when Jake Sullivan has talked about China, he has spoken about building a high fence around a narrow garden, uh, meaning that we, should work, we as the U.S. should work aggressively to protect our edge in a handful of key technologies and products, but that will allow most trade and investment ties to continue largely on commercial terms. How do you think about the width of the garden and the height of the, uh, the, height of the walls? And how do you assess your progress in getting to alignment on that width and the height of those walls within the G7 and our sort of core industrial partners? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I think that you know, there has been a kind of caricature out there of uh, how the U.S. has been approaching China, how that differs from the way Europe and other key allies have been approaching China. But I think the caricature is just that, a caricature. If you look back to the Hiroshima summit uh, last month, what you saw was a historic degree of unity on some core precepts about how in common we're going to approach uh, the challenge uh, of China's Economy. So things like making clear, to your point, we're not about decoupling from China, but we are about taking certain targeted steps uh, to de-risk our economy, both in terms of protecting some core technologies as well as investing in our technological industrial capacity and our supply chain uh, resilience. So I think that's really the, the, the cornerstone you know, of an approach to say, you know, Three years ago, the G7 didn't speak at all to the 
to China. And here we are today, just three years later, um, seeing a really comprehensive uh, approach in common on how to, in unity, uh, sort of address the, the, the challenge presented by China. To go into some more specificity, you know, around the particulars of your question around the, the small garden and the high fence, and I do think that at some of you, you do have to get to the particulars because that's where, you know, the rubber meets the road in terms of making that principle real. You know, to, to take an, an example, you know, like outbound investment, you know, I think we think it's critical that for a handful of sensitive national security related technologies that we have a, a toolkit that includes uh, restrictions on outbound investment that can prevent uh, those handful of critical technologies from enabling uh, China's military and surveillance modernization. And um, we think that part of the way to make that toolkit effective, part of the way to make it durable over time is to make sure that we are aligned with our closest allies and partners in taking steps in common to do that. So the work of, of much of the early part of this year was working to achieve that alignment on things like outbound investment with the EU, with the UK, with the broader G7. And I think uh, what you've seen over the period of, of the, the past few months has really embodied that a degree of alignment, that sense of common purpose. And I think the second piece, and I think, you know, why, um, you know, why there still hasn't, you still haven't seen, you know, an official announcement of a, of a program from the United States is, this is hard to get right. You know, these are very uh, technical questions, both in terms of defining the technologies, in terms of defining the types of investments, uh, in terms of consulting with not just allies and partners, but also industry and other stakeholders to make sure that we're doing this in a thoughtful, targeted way that you know, gets it right when it comes to the shape of the garden, when it gets it right with respect to the height of the fence. And I think that I think the core point I would just say is, you know, getting that right requires getting into the weeds of the particulars and getting that right means being really thoughtful about how you do some of these some of these definitions. And that's what we're hard at work doing right now. Great, um, thank you. I, uh, uh, I actually have many more questions I could ask you, and in particular, I wanna get to a question on uh, climate and CBAMs, but I actually want to, because I know you have to leave in about 17, 18 minutes, and I wanna be respectful that you have the bosses calling. Um, and, uh, and so I would like to now open it up to the audience for some questions. Um, and I'm gonna take a couple at a time, if you're in the room, we can raise your hand. I'll take two or three at a time. If you are online, uh, there is a, uh, a link you can use online to ask, uh, ask questions online. I will see them here on this iPad in front of me, and I'll begin to work the online questions uh, in uh, as, uh, as well. Let me start with John uh, over here. And please identify yourself when you, uh, I know who many of you are, but not everybody does. So. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I'm John Elkind with the Columbia University Center on Global Energy Policy. So I want to channel uh, Peter and pose a question about EU and U.S. Uh, trade and climate. Um, yesterday or the day before, press reporting says that the European Union has um, pushed back, resisting the proposal for the shape of a global arrangement for sustainable steel and aluminum. Um, the question that this begs at a time when they are very invested in carbon border adjustment mechanism, and we have just gone through all the pain and agony of passing the Inflation Reduction Act, is whether there is space for compromise in these two very different approaches to making progress on climate change. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna take one or two more uh, over here. Let me take this one, and then I'll come to Tamika. Yeah. Uh, Peter Rasch from the American German Institute at Johns Hopkins. Um, it seems that starting in the 40s and increasingly into the 1990s, we had an economic order that's become global, but that that global economic order isn't functioning well all right now. Do you think that the US needs to invest in this concept of global economic order? Do you, or rather, do you think that the discrete issue-based engagements that you describe, sort of G7 plus, Asia, Latin America, those are sufficient? 
All right, and the last one I'll take is from Tamika here, and then I'll come back to you, and then we'll open it for another round. Thanks, Peter, and thank you, Mike, for all the, the great work that you all are doing. You touched at the beginning on the extraordinary efforts that the administration has engaged in to reshore innovation capacity, specifically as it relates to semiconductors in the United States. And in that instance, you had a technology that was incubated here and for a variety of reasons did not seem particularly fashionable or strategically important and ended up overseas when other countries created more advantageous conditions for the growth of the technology. We saw a similar story play out with 5G. Fast forward to where we are today now with digital assets. And we see virtually every other advanced economy, the EU, the UK, Japan, all putting in place very thoughtful, responsible regulatory frameworks. Your former colleagues at BlackRock, Fidelity, Schwab, a variety of the largest financial institutions in the US, all signaling they think this is going to be an important piece uh, of economic activity going forward. And yet the United States at this point appears to be speed running some of the mistakes that were made in conjunction with those past technologies by not creating an environment that is conducive for the responsible evolution of that technology in the United States. I hope I'm wrong, but uh, let me know how, uh, how we can fix that. And uh, Peter obviously did extraordinary work on this when he was in government. So uh, Peter, I'd love to hear any thoughts you have as well. Well, I'm not gonna share my thoughts here. This is for Mike, uh, but let's, uh, I, three questions for you. Um, John, I particularly appreciate because that was basically exactly the last question I had wanted to ask, so thank you very much. Um, but obviously also important questions uh, from, uh, from Peter on sort of what's working and not, and then to Mike and digital assets, over to you. Sure, uh, yeah, so maybe take those in turn. Um, you know, I think, again, I'd sort of take a step back and sort of speak more conceptually about kind of where we are with respect to the issue that you raised. You know, President Biden and President von der Leyen, you know, two Octobers ago said, you know, it is critical that uh, the U.S. and the EU come together to do a couple of things when it comes to steel and aluminum. And obviously, you know, steel and aluminum are critical industrial industries that are really at the kind of foundation of uh, so much that we're looking to do here that the Europeans are looking to do in terms of rebuilding our infrastructure, our manufacturing capacity, and the like. And also, of course, you know, a source of um, really strong middle class union jobs both here and, and overseas. Um, you know, and what were the challenges that the presidents identified at that time? You know, one a global market that had been distorted for years by the opaque non-market pra practices and policies of, of China that had led to global overcapacity, that had led to global oversupply, and needing to be sure that uh, any steps that the US and the EU took in common on steel and aluminum would meet the challenge of that distortion of the, the global market as embodied in China's practices. Secondly, a recognition that uh, key industries like steel and aluminum um, needed to have a pathway to becoming more green, becoming less carbon intensive over time. And in fact, for the United States, that was going to be a key source of uh, competitive advantage uh, in those industries uh, over time. I think that uh, what you've seen is a really constructive set of dialogue on those key questions between the US and Europe, a recognition that now we're in a critical phase where we really do have to accelerate the work between you know, now and the fall to, to, to see what progress uh, can be achieved. Uh, I think we're very hopeful uh, that the timeline that the president's laid out uh, two years ago or almost two years ago can, can be met. I will say, and I think that uh, you know, you, you sort of point to the, the kind of key conceptual <laughs> challenge of the work, which is, you know, Europe has a particular approach on how to achieve these objectives built around uh, price mechanisms, both domestically and, and with respect to uh, how they look overseas. You know, we have our own distinct approach, um, you know, founded in the, now the Inflation Reduction Act, founded in investing uh, in uh, innovative technology uh, and investment in this space. And getting those two different approaches to speak to one another in ways that can 
you know, work at the kind of granular detail of, of, of trade investment rules uh, is a complicated challenge and one that's being worked on at the expert level across a number of different forums globally at the OECD, uh, the G7 under Germany's presidency founded uh, what's called a climate club to do exactly this type of methodological work. Uh, and I think that you know, this is a really important proof point, uh, the global steel and aluminum arrangement that's uh, gonna hopefully take that methodological work about getting different systems to speak to one another and really begin the process of turning that into uh, a system, turning that into a set of arrangements that can, that can work uh, durably over time to, to, to get different approaches to work together. So that's the work that we're like, you know, in the midst of right now uh, and expect to be very focused on in the, the months ahead. Um, you know, on the, the second question, you know, I, you know, I would just say again, the work that I do day in day, in, day out is exactly about uh, engaging in the diplomacy of ensuring that we have uh, a set of global economic relationships that, that work together that further both our own um, interests uh, around rebuilding capacity, around building resilience, around building inclusivity, and being sure that that, that uh, same set of objectives is achievable by our closest allies, like through the G7, as well as a broader set of partners around the world, including in the developing world, going to the, the question that Peter asked earlier. So, you know, when I think about how I, you know, where I'm spending my efforts, it's all about, you know, okay, we're investing, you're investing, how do we align our efforts in ways that are gonna work in common to achieve those objectives? Okay, the needs in the developing world, world are overwhelming, how do we build a toolkit that's gonna allow us to facilitate investment uh, to meet the overwhelming needs in that part of the world? That to me is the, business of the moment. That's a very, I think, positive global vision for what it means for the United States to lead in the global economy. And I think that's what we're all focused on, on doing. Um, with respect to the third, you know, I will say this is an issue that I'm at some remove from. Uh, I got plenty on my plate and I have some <laughs> friends who are much more expert at this than me, but I will say that I think we're very focused on uh, ensuring that we have a regulatory framework that is going to promote consumer protection, is going to promote financial stability. Certainly, we've seen, you know, risks from um, emerging financial technologies, uh, you know, even in the past kind of handful of months, uh, and being sure that we have a regulatory approach that can really um, manage those risks, be fit to purpose for those risks, I think is something that we're very committed to doing uh, and uh, would say is gonna be the, uh, a core focus looking ahead. Um, other, uh, other questions, and while people are raising their hands, I'm gonna um, offer a comment. It's sort of an interesting, you've laid out, I think, a pretty interesting you know, thesis that the, the macroeconomic challenge of the world you face today is not around shortages of movement of goods around the world. Plenty of movement of goods around the world. The shortage, both at home and internationally, really is a shortage of investment. Yeah. And the solution is to galvanize investment. And so it's just been interesting to hear a really kind of investment forward international economics agenda. Um, one other comment I wanted to make on John's uh, question, and I'm quite loath to make this comment because here I am at Carnegie about to give some credit to a rival think tank. But, you know, it's important to have good ideas no matter uh, where they're from. And I would give, um, I, I would, I would, I would uh, recommend to everybody, uh, my friend and colleague um, Brad Setzer at CFR, some of his thinking recently on how you might be able to square this circle uh, between the U.S. and EU, because I do think there's like a, a thorny, you know, strategically a lot of alignment, yeah. a lot of challenges on kind of our different systems having to mesh up, and just a, a thought for folks uh, around the room. Um, questions, uh, questions coming, uh, coming in. Let me come here, and then I'm going to take. Uh, I'm also going to weave in a couple from online. Hi, I'm uh, Jim Mann, uh, author based at Johns Hopkins Sice. Uh, this is not current events, but what they came from, uh, the industrial policy, as you said, stemmed from um, uh, hollowing out and competition with China. 
So that raises the question, uh, the, bo and both of those stem from the D China's entry into the WTO. So I hear now three different, I hear sh there shouldn't have been a deal. I, should, I, I hear um, that those job losses stem from the fact there were too many loopholes in the deal. And I hear from those who negotiated the deal the argument that the deal was fine, but the successor administration, or through the aughts, didn't enforce the deal. I just wondered what you thought. Other questions in the room? Uh, I, will, I also want to weave in a question from uh, online. We've gotten a couple of questions online uh, coming back to the question about the agenda for the Global South. Um, and in particular in Latin America, you know, for countries like Brazil and Argentina, we have a long sort of history of um, political and uh, geopolitical interest in our hemisphere haven't always had the warmest economic relationships or the warmest political uh, relationships. Kind of, if you could elaborate a little bit on what some of the, the agenda is for our, our, uh, our hemisphere. Um, maybe those two questions. Sure. Um, you know, with respect to China, I would just say I'm mostly focused on what it means to manage the relationship from where we are today. And I think where we are today is still confronting uh, a China that has a set of policies and practices that aren't market-oriented, that are incredibly opaque, that are still centered on um, seeking uh, forms of, of technology and IP transfer that don't be, play by core rules. And how do we have an approach that, both for ourselves and alongside our allies and partners, addresses those core concerns and builds an economy here and in our alongside our closest allies and partners that will allow us to be resilient to that, that's going to ensure that we aren't dependent on yeah, at your back. back. Um, <laughs> that ensures that we don't have any strategic dependencies on any one ch country, including China. And that's the kind of agenda that I talked about earlier. It's an agenda around uh, protecting with the toolkit a very narrow set of technologies that have national security application. It's around investing both for ourselves and our allies in, um, in some of those key areas like industries in clean energy and semiconductors like building in common a set of resilient supply chain relationships. Um, those are the things that, that I'm focused on because I think that, that that's really the work today of ensuring we have you know, a vibrant industrial sector that employs a vibrant middle class uh, and that ensures that our network of economic relationships and supply chains is going to be um, not dependent on any one source, including China, so that we aren't um, uh, so that we're in a, in a position to uh, confront shocks, uh, whatever those are, uh, and, uh, and ultimately uh, a system that will you know, be able to, uh, to, to, to stand up to whatever challenges the, the, the economy presents. And Latin America. Well, Latin America. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of, the, one of the things that's been clear, I think, in um, my own engagements in the region is just how hungry for economic engagement um, that part of the world uh, is. You know, I think one of the things that's unique about Latin America is um, how extensive the network of free trade agreements already is uh, in, that, in that part of the world. And so in some ways, the question that you posed around IPATH is even kind of more acute, or my response to that is even more kind of strongly felt in Latin America versus other parts of the world, which is to say, you know, there are already FTAs. You know, the problem of, um, the problems that we face are, are forward-looking problems, are emergent problems, are problems of supply chains, are problems of clean energy, are problems of tax and anti-corruption, and how do we advance an agenda there that meets those needs, recognizing that, you know, that, 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 the, the trade question really just isn't of moment in the, in the same way uh, there. 
you know, I think that one of the, the key questions that we face in particular with respect to countries like Chile, uh, with whom, again, we do have an FTA, is how do we uh, build a, a vibrant um, uh, relationship around critical minerals, recognizing that ultimately the success of our clean energy investments here of putting Americans to work around the clean energy transition, around EVs, is going to be incumbent on building secure, stable sources of supply to feed those industries. And countries like Chile have to and need to be uh, a critical part of, of, of how we do that, recognizing that, uh, that the needs are so great that domestic sources of those materials are never going to be enough to really feed uh, where that industry needs to go in the U.S. Um, well, I would love to go on, but I know you have to get back to the White House, and we are now uh, at 1045. But I do, before we close, uh, want to give you a chance to offer any final uh, thoughts or, or remarks. And I'm sorry we're not able to get to all the questions uh, that I know folks have. Yeah, I mean, I think the last thing I would say is, you know, I will say I, I'm, I'm struck regularly by kind of two things that I sometimes um, hear uh, in the conversation. One is a kind of sense that relative to uh, the past, that America's approach to the world economy is somehow sort of less optimistic, more pessimistic. And secondly, a sense that uh, our relationships with um, allies and, and partners aren't kind of front and center in how were approaching the global economy. And, and I'll just say from where I sit, there's just a, both seem fundamentally off base to me. You know, I think as Jake talked about, you know, the Biden domestic economic vision, the Biden international economic vision is one that puts building at its core, building capacity, building resilience, building inclusivity. And I can think of like nothing more optimistic than investing and building for the future as we're working to do at home and working to do alongside our allies and working to do alongside partners around the world. But as at its core, I think, not just an optimistic vision for the moment, but an optimistic vision kind of across the longer sweep of history. And I'm just like wildly excited to be a part of it. Um, and then the second thing is, you know, when I look at, and I know you were a key part of this as well, when I look at our relationships with our closest allies and partners, this is a historic moment in terms of that degree of unity. You know, certainly that was sort of founded in important ways in this administration with Russia's invasion and the unity that came out of that and the common response, including through you know, a sanctions regime that you were so important to, to building, but has gone on from there to encompass, okay, how do we work together and partner on the clean energy transition, all the work that I talked about? How do we strike a common approach on China when three years ago we weren't talking about China at all in forums like that? And so when I look across the work that we're doing with allies and partners on easy issues, on hard issues, on issues that weren't even talked about and are incredibly complicated, you know, I just see a historic moment in terms of that degree of unity and that sense of common purpose and a common kind of work plan for what it means to achieve some big common objectives in the global economy. And that too, I think, is, uh, is historic and important and at the heart of you know, how the president has thought about um, the global economy and the global order for a long time, which puts America's allies at the center of that conversation. Well, that is a really um, hopeful and optimistic and very appropriate note to end on. Um, please join me in thanking Mike uh, for joining us today. Really appreciate the remarks. And thank you very, very much. All right. All right. So good to see you. Yeah.